nature may have separated dinosaurs and man by millions of years, but filmmakers have always found a way to bring the two together. Our fascination with these incredible prehistoric animals and their less than accommodating attitude is a match made in Hollywood heaven. I think the reason why dinosaurs are so attractive to fantasy films is the fact that they look fantastic. You can't believe they existed and yet they did. It's very easy to explain why dinosaurs are fascinating. Dinosaurs are nature's special effects. It is Hollywood special effects artists who, generation after generation, have brought these magnificent creatures to life, discovering them in the lost worlds of King Kong and the Valley of Guanji. Traveling back in time to their kingdom in one million years BC, and employing genetic engineering to resurrect them in Jurassic Park. By recreating tyrannosaurs, brachiosaurs, and triceratops, these filmmakers have turned nature's primeval designs into one of cinema's most popular genres and fueled a phenomenon that can only be called Dino-mania. Magic presents Dino Mania. By the time Steven Spielberg's Jurassic Park hit the big screen, visual effects had advanced to the point where moviegoers were able to witness what many scientists agreed were the most realistic looking dinosaurs ever. As technical advisor on the film, paleontologist Jack Horner emphasized the most recent theories of dinosaurs as warm-blooded, intelligent animals related to not reptiles, but birds. If someone asked, where can I go see what a dinosaur looked like, I would say, go look at the movie Jurassic Park. But before filmmakers had the technology to produce prehistoric realism, they had to find other, more creative ways to satisfy movie audiences' cravings for dinosaurs. A baby dinosaur! Ah! Tyrannosaurus Rex! Ah! Until the mid-1980s, almost all paleontologists agreed that dinosaurs were the ancient relatives of modern-day reptiles. So it's no surprise that filmmakers often depicted dinosaurs by using cosmetically altered lizards, alligators, and even turtles. The big hit of 1940, one million BC, pitted caveman Victor Mature against a ferocious iguana. Irwin Allen's 1960 remake of The Lost World featured a climactic battle between a caiman crocodile from the Caribbean and a giant monitor lizard from Singapore, each approximately six feet in length. A smaller lizard was used for the so-called fire monster. Fishing line tied around its body enabled off-camera handlers to manipulate its movements. I thought that was very creative. I mean, putting horns on, in fact, every time my parents would buy me a lizard, I would try to turn him into a dinosaur. The collaboration of science and art in the visualization of dinosaurs actually dates back to the beginnings of paleontology. In the early 1850s, British scientist Richard Owen, who first coined the term dinosauria, or terrible lizards, commissioned sculptor Waterhouse Hawkins to create life-size models of what the ancient creatures might have looked like. Hawkins sculptures, which still stand in London's Crystal Palace Park, sparked the public's imagination and attracted crowds of curious spectators. Dinosaur art is usually 20, 30, 40, 50 years ahead of science. The Crystal Palace sculptures were way ahead of their time. I think what happens is 
artists who do dinosaurs, whether they're Waterhouse Hawkins making a life-size sculpture, or Spielberg's artist reconstructing a whole flock of gallimimuses, and a quote artist often is better at seeing structure, seeing legs, seeing movement, seeing behavior, than someone with a PhD. The quest to bring totally believable dinosaurs to the screen began simply enough as a line drawing. In 1912, popular cartoonist Windsor McKay animated cinema's first dinosaur, a personable diplodocus named Gertie. But one man, more than any other, is responsible for bringing cinematic dinosaurs to life. The year was 1914, and Willis O'Brien was 28 years old. He had just fashioned a prize fighter out of clay, and as he moved the figure into various poses, the idea came to him of using such three-dimensional models to create a moving picture. This marked the birth of stop-motion animation. And within a year, O'Brien had produced his first short film for the Edison Company called The Dinosaur and the Missing Link. The craft of stop-motion animation, having started uh, virtually in O'Brien's garage with his uh, work that he did for Edison, is a process wherein a three-dimensional object is manipulated uh, incrementally uh, one frame at a time All various joints, momentums, actions are very infinitesimally adjusted. And then one frame of motion picture film is shot that records the image. And then you go back through the entire process, again, uh, making sure that all the joints are moving in the proper direction with the proper momentum. And this will generate a, uh, a complete performance once the film is later projected at 24 frames a second. In 1920, after completing several short prehistoric melodramas, O'Brien was ready to begin his first feature-length film, an adaptation of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's best-selling novel, The Lost World. The story tells of an expedition to a remote South American plateau where dinosaurs still exist. O'Brien designed the inner skeletons, or armatures, for the film's 49 dinosaurs. Then, a gifted young artist named Marcel Delgado completed the models, based on the paintings of Charles R. Knight at the American Museum of Natural History. Delgado used red bath sponge for the stuffing and thin sheets of rubber for the skin. As revealed in the May 1925 issue of Science and Invention, he installed football bladders inside many of the dinosaurs, which could be inflated or deflated slightly with each exposed frame to produce the illusion of breathing. O'Brien spent 14 months animating the dinosaur sequences, and his growing proficiency at stop motion resulted in prehistoric animals that were well ahead of their time. At that time, if you went to a museum, you would see Brontosaurus restored as a very slow animal, stupid animal, living alone, stuck in the swamps. Willis O'Brien has Brontosaurus in a herd moving over dry land and spreading dust and, and defending their young against meat-eating allosaurs. It's a, it's a wonderful tableau. When The Lost World opened in 1925, it was an immediate sensation. One reviewer called it a picture that will achieve as much word-of-mouth advertising as any in motion picture history. I go back to uh, you know, those reviews of 1925. You know, the filmmakers must have gone back to the plateau you know, in South America and shot real dinosaurs. And they're as ecstatic as the reviews for Jurassic Park. With The Lost World, Willis O'Brien not only achieved the most realistic dinosaurs to date, he also set a standard for future filmmakers and firmly established the dinosaur genre as a mainstay of special effects. In 
In 1948, the first dinosaur film made in color, Unknown Island, utilized a budget-conscious effects technique common for its era, men in dino suits. The way the suits were built is that they were in them and then they just had literally wires they were pulling. So that's why the hands were just kind of doing this. And they had another wire they could pull for the mouth. And these guys couldn't see a thing in them at all. They were totally blind. And when the only way the guys could rest, though, is they had to get a prop guy and he had to bend over and the guys would lean on him. It was very hot the day they shot this stuff. It was, it was close to 100 degrees. And in these suits, it was a lot hotter than that. And this one guy was just like wandering around, you know, getting into position, and all of a sudden, they just trying to go I think they actually used the scene where a guy really fainted and fell over. <laughs> when it came to creating believable dinosaurs, men in suits couldn't hold a candle to stop motion animation. That art form reached its pinnacle in 1933. I remember seeing Lewis O'Brien's movie, King Kong. I guess I was in my teens at the time. My favorite, of course, was the Tyrannosaurus and his great fight with uh, King Kong. In a way, it's too bad that he lost. For dinosaur experts like Ken Carpenter of the Denver Museum of Natural History and world-renowned paleontologist Robert Bakker, Willis O'Brien's masterwork has only gotten better with age. He was two generations ahead of his time. His dinosaurs act and move like Jurassic Park dinosaurs, like 1995 dinosaurs. With King Kong, O'Brien had attained a mastery of his craft, adding subtleties of performance that made his dinosaurs all the more lifelike. In one of the most spectacular animated sequences ever filmed, O'Brien's Tyrannosaurus Rex stops briefly to scratch its jaw before plunging headlong into mortal combat with the mighty Kong. Well, I was at the tender age of 13 when I first saw King Kong, and it changed my whole life. I went back again and again to see the film on its reissues and finally discovered the glories of stop-motion photography. A fire was lit inside of young Ray Harryhausen, and he set his sights on following in O'Brien's footsteps. It wasn't long before the teenager was filming his own animation models. One of the first puppets was a cave bear I made. I cut up my mother's fur coat. So I made many experiments on 16 millimeter. At the age of 19, Harryhausen had the opportunity to meet the man whose work he had come to idolize. I first met Willis O'Brien at MGM. A friend of mine knew him and told me to call him up. And uh, I told him I was experimenting with dinosaurs on my own. And he kindly invited me over to MGM. So I piled some of my models into a suitcase. And uh, I brought them over to show him. And I took them out of the suitcase. And my first one was, I think, a stegosaurus. And he looked at it a while and he said, you'll have to study anatomy because your legs of your stegosaurus look like sausages. Harryhausen took O'Brien's advice, enrolling not only in anatomy class, but also taking courses in drawing, sculpture, photography, and film editing. Soon he was modeling more advanced dinosaur puppets and shooting test footage for a project he called Evolution. Harryhausen kept in touch with O'Brien over the years, and in 1947, O'Brien hired him as his assistant on Mighty Joe Young. Of course, that was the great thrill of my life, because uh, to work with Willis O'Brien on another gorilla picture was just unbelievable. After two and a half years working alongside his mentor, Harryhausen's next project was his first as chief of technical effects. The beast, the beast, the beast from 20,000 fathoms. The beast from 20,000 fathoms is the story of a prehistoric monster freed from the ice that wreaks havoc on civilization. The beast from 20,000 fathoms was actually a conglomerate. I started out with an Allosaurus or a Tyrannosaurus concept. And then gradually I realized you had to have it so that it wouldn't be more like an amphibian. So I gave it four legs and the body uh, took on a different structure than the known dinosaurs. 
Released in 1953, the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms was a smashing success. Having cost only $200,000 to make, the film took in more than $5 million at the box office, and the Beast set the tone for every monster on the loose film to come. During the next decade, Harryhausen turned his talents to mythology, producing such films as The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad and Jason and the Argonauts. Then, in 1965, he was enticed to start work on a remake of One Million Years B.C. I felt we could do a better job by using the stop motion process rather than enlarge lizards. And dinosaurs, after all, I did have a soft spot in my heart for dinosaurs. One million years B.C. erupts on the screen with both excitement. Even then, most scientists thought dinosaurs were just slugs, great mesozoic uh, behemoths that could barely move. And um, Harryhausen's dinosaurs really moved the way we now know they did. Upon completing one million years BC, Harryhausen turned his attention to an unrealized project of Willis O'Brien's about an Allosaurus named Guanji. O'Brien, now deceased, had drawn storyboards for the film, including a sequence where several cowboys try to capture Guanji with lassos. Guanji, Guanji. So that there would be something on the set for the cowboys to rope, we built a crossbar on the Jeep, and uh, the cowboys would rope this crossbar, and then it was my job to blot out the Jeep and put the dinosaur in its place. Guanji who made his debut in 1969, was Harryhausen's most expressive dinosaur yet, and took the recreation of prehistoric beasts to a new level. Over the course of 55 years, Willis O'Brien and Ray Harryhausen, mentor and protege, used the art of cinema to the fullest, turning back the pages of history and introducing three generations of moviegoers to Dino Mania. I remember having this little book of how the Earth began. And I, I remember just being completely mesmerized by the one, you know, cool picture of the big, they called it the Brontosaurus, you know, in those days, the Thunder Lizard. The earliest memory I have of seeing any sort of dinosaur was the Beast in 20,000 Fathoms. And I think I was about seven. And I remember hiding behind the the seat in the movie theater in downtown Los Angeles and sort of sticking my head up and then having to cower down again. Even before reaching their teens, Phil Tippett was drawing and sculpting dinosaurs and Dennis Muren was shooting his own eight millimeter dino movies. Growing up in different cities, neither could have imagined they would one day work together on such films as Star Wars. The Empire Strikes Back and Dragon Slayer. In 1983, Muren and Tippett's collaboration on Return of the Jedi earned them Academy Awards. Then, for a few years, their paths would part. Muren stayed on at George Lucas's Industrial Light and Magic, or ILM, to supervise visual effects on Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Tippett, now recognized as a master of stop-motion animation, took a year off to film dinosaurs in his garage. I was more interested in, in taking this fondness and this love for you know, prehistoric animals, so I kind of created this little um, morality tale about a, a creature that, that goes into the forest to find more succulent vegetation and, and becomes greedy and is stalked by a killer. Mm -hmm. In the title itself, Prehistoric Beast, is a, a phrase or a line that's pulled out of King Kong when they, when they shoot the, the first Stegosaurus. Jack Driscoll asks, what do you call this thing? Why, something from the dinosaur family. A prehistoric Beast. The T-Rex in, in Prehistoric Beast was you know, my attempt to, uh, to begin to, to play on the, the hot-blooded dinosaur theory. Its tail didn't drag along the ground as, as had been you know, portrayed cinematically and paleontologically to me. It makes you know, complete sense. Why would anything drag its tail along the ground? 
I first met Phil Tippett um, through a mutual friend. He introduced us at his house, and the, the night I met Phil Tippett, he showed me what he'd been working on for a year, which uh, was, in terms of concept, so far ahead of anything that I had seen before. Doug Henderson, one of the world's foremost paleontological illustrators, was soon collaborating with Tippett on his next project, a television documentary entitled Dinosaur. I did small little sketches, and I would call them compositional drawings. They showed animals in scenes, uh, poses, and he brought it to life. In designing the documentary's dramatized sequences, Henderson and Tippett drew on the scientific theories of paleontologist Jack Horner. Horner says, you know, that these things were actually really very sophisticated animals, and they had, like, family groups, and it looked like their behavior was a, a very supportive one. After Dinosaur, Tippett rejoined the Hollywood mainstream, animating characters in such films as Willow and Robocop 2. But it was only a matter of time before his primeval calling once again caught up with him. About two years before I was hired on Jurassic, I got a call from Stephen who said, we're going to make this great dinosaur movie, and I'm going to make it all with, you know, full-scale, you know, dinosaurs. I said, what are you talking to me for? You know, I, I work with the little puppets. Uh, and um, he said, just look at the thing anyway, you know, and, and see what you think. Spielberg had already lined up Dennis Muren, by now a seven-time Academy Award winner, to be the film's visual effects supervisor. I certainly didn't think that it had the potential of being the greatest dinosaur film of all time. I was worried that we weren't going to be able to make the technology with what we had work in today's audiences. Over the next year, Spielberg decided that the dinosaurs would be created through a combination of full-scale robotics created by Stan Winston Studio and stop-motion animation. With Tippett now signed on, his first job was to create what became known as the Dinosaur Bible, establishing walk and run cycles, and other basic movements for the T-Rex and Velociraptor. The next step was to film rough stop-motion versions of the storyboards called animatics. It was during this stage that the nuance of the dinosaurs' performances evolved. We began to play with, with ideas of what this predatory animal is. It comes upon an object that it has never seen before, but there's these two little morsels that are sitting inside. What dramatically can you do with that? It's got one foot up in a wheel, and it sort of attacks with its snout the belly of the car. And that's stuff that I've seen a cat do with a mouse. You know, you may not remember where you saw it, but it'll look like real things to you. And we did that pretty much all the way, you know, through the film, as many chances as we could. The Velociraptor performances in Tippett's animatic of the kitchen sequence nearly match those in the final film, except for one behavior that caught the eye of Jurassic's technical advisor. I gave the, the raptors a, uh, at one point a, a tongue that, that flicked in and out like a lizard, and, and Jack Horner got really mad about that. But he said that, that uh, dinosaurs didn't do that, reptiles did that, and dinosaurs were not reptiles, dinosaurs are birds. Meanwhile, Murin was looking for an opportunity to utilize ILM's fast-developing computer-generated, or CG, effects. The logical starting point was a Gallimimus stampede sequence. Well, if you could make one dinosaur, then you could clone it many times at no additional cost. And so we did a test, and the result was astonishing. At the same time, one of Murin's senior computer animators, Steve Williams, began experimenting with a CG T-Rex. And one day I went over to ILM and I said, hey, come here, take a look at this, and I looked at it. I said, oh, oh, God. <laughs> oh, you know, it's, it doesn't look great, but, you know, is this the end of stop motion animation as we know it? In what is now considered a turning point in the history of special effects, Spielberg did, in fact, decide to replace the stop motion with CG. But Tippett stayed on the film, and his studio and ILM collaborated on development of technology that would bring stop motion into the digital age. The result was the Dinosaur Input Device, or DID, 
a stop-motion armature with encoders that transmit movements into the computer. It was used to animate several shots in the main road and kitchen raptor sequences. It, it gave it a chance for both crews to go with the technology they were sort of used to, you know, the hands-on Phil Tippett approach and the, and the mouse approach, you know, the ILM approach. And we used both techniques in the film, and they both worked just fine. For both Phil Tippett and Dennis Muren, the journey to Jurassic Park began as a childhood fascination, sparked by opening a dinosaur book or seeing a Harryhausen film. Now their dinosaurs will undoubtedly point the way for the next generation of special effects artists. I was right. We're going to see things on this island that no other human being has ever seen. 1948's Unknown Island was populated not only by men in dino suits, but also mechanical dinosaurs on tracks. For many years, their lack of mobility limited mechanical dinosaurs to brief cameo appearances. But that changed in 1985 with Baby, Secret of the Lost Legend. The movie revolves around a family of brontosaurs discovered in present-day Africa. Veteran mechanical effects artist Isidoro Raponi, who had helped build the title character in the 1975 remake of King Kong and the alien in Close Encounters of the Third Kind, was given the task of creating Baby and his enormous parents. We did a lot of research with the expert in dinosaur, all the information about the length, the height, what kind of food they were eating, you know, about all this generic information, we decide what kind of dinosaur we want to build. Raponi designed a full-size mechanical neck and tail for the mother and father dinosaurs. For the much smaller and more agile baby brontosaurus, mobility was achieved by a performer concealed inside the body. While creative license was taken with the look of the dinosaurs, for example, giving them large human-like eyes, Raponi's engineering produced a more believable, fluid-moving mechanical creature than had been seen before. Then came 1993, a big year for dinosaurs, in which Jurassic Park was not the only movie to feature a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Super Mario Brothers also had a T-Rex, albeit on a smaller scale. Yoshi um, is a young baby dinosaur that was uh, made to look like a fantasy character, cute and cuddly. The challenge for Dave Nelson and his crew at Animated Engineering was to cram nearly 200 feet of cable and several hundred moving parts into Yoshi's three-foot-tall body. To operate Yoshi, it takes uh, nine puppeteers. It's fully cable controlled, and then the, uh, the head itself is all radio controlled. So on the controller, I have the ankle here, and then his knee up there. What I have here is the controls for the uh, arms on the puppet. I have a, uh, a wrist right here at my thumb, and this trigger squeezes his fingers. Then I have an elbow bend right here. Okay, I control the tail. This controller over here controls the top portion of the tail. I can go up and down and side to side and anywhere in between that. I have a head right and left. And head up and down and head side to side. And on this one, I've got neck up and down, uh, body torso side to side, and also torso twist. That was pretty difficult to get that synced up. We just all coordinate and work together. The other film's T-Rex was larger and slightly more menacing. The Tyrannosaurus Rex, we built full size. Why did you do a robot with a dinosaur that big? Well, because too big to be a guy in a suit. With his 9,000-pound hydraulically-powered T-Rex, Stan Winston brought mechanical dinosaurs into the space age. His studio built several other mechanical dinosaurs for Jurassic Park, including the ailing Triceratops, the two-faced Dilophosaurus, 
and the immense head of a tree-eating Brachiosaurus. But the studio's first task was to design the look of all of the film's prehistoric animals, whether they would ultimately be created physically or in the computer. We wanted to create the look of these dinosaurs to be the most correct dinosaurs we have ever seen based on all the knowledge we got from our research and from talking to paleontologists. But in fact, the only thing that is an absolute with dinosaurs is the bone structures that have been left. What we had to do was bring our artistic representation to the forefront, trust our instincts, and that's the right texture, that's the right amount of muscle, that's the right coloring. Why is that right? Because it looks right. Because it feels right. Jurassic Park's most complex dinosaurs, from a performance standpoint, were the velociraptors. Winston's team created several mechanical body parts designed for specific shots, and a fully animatronic raptor, perhaps the most convincing physical dinosaur since the real thing. Paleontologists to this day have said these are the most accurate dinosaurs they have seen. And that's a real feather in our cap and, and something I'm extremely proud of. A good dinosaur film will always invoke something in your brain because a good dinosaur film has an enormous amount of thought in it. It's not just looking at the shape of the critter, it's behavior. Probably no other film genre has been more influenced by science than dinosaur movies. And probably no other genre has been watched more carefully by the scientists themselves. Watching these movies always gets me thinking about why, what's going on inside the animal's head. Because a good artist gets inside an animal's head. Like for instance, in King Kong, they see a stegosaur a couple hundred yards away. I've always thought to myself, that's got to be a bull stegosaur because it's by itself and it's extremely belligerent. So it's like it's patrolling its territory. My favorite dinosaur film is Jurassic Park. For me, the part that actually sent chills down my back was when I saw the Triceratops and you could see its chest heaving up and down as it was breathing. It just came so alive to me. My favorite scene is Alan Grant's viewing the duckbill dinosaurs off in the, in the distance. And it is my favorite scene just because, because it's me watching, you know, my theory work. Accuracy of the visual portrayal of dinosaurs can be easily checked against the body of paleontological knowledge. But when it comes to sound, there's very little science to go on. We know they made sounds, or at least our assumption has to be that they made sounds because the animals they're more cl most closely related to that are alive today, which are birds, make sounds. In Kong, they use the lion's roar and a raspberry run backwards uh, and combine them with other sounds. Guanji uh, was a combination of a camel a slobbering combined with uh, metallic clapping of, uh, like a bear trap so that as he, you hear that blah, 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 and then a snap. For Jurassic Park, the assignment of giving voice to the dinosaurs went to Academy Award-winning sound designer Gary Rydstrom at Skywalker Sound. He worked closely with dinosaur supervisor Phil Tippett in order to incorporate the latest paleontological ideas. Early on, he was beneficial because he could literally crawl around this mix room, pantomiming what, the, what a raptor might move like and give me the basic motions even before any of the animation was done. Rydstrom and his Skywalker team were brought onto Jurassic well before the start of filming. This afforded Rydstrom's assistant, Christopher Boys, ample time to collect a variety of new sounds. I started by recording snakes and different large lizards, and uh, then I went out and recorded all sorts of birds and uh, Horses, I mean, it, it just got to the point that any animal that made a vocalization, I was interested in. Dinosaur sounds we're studying a lot now. 
Brachiosaurus, for instance, has an echo chamber about the size of a basketball in its nose. And the sound would be incredible. It'd be very deep. The Brachiosaurus are a combination of a lot of singing-like animal vocals. Uh, oddly enough, a donkey was used for a lot of it. Um, not the standard hee-haw donkey, but parts of the donkey that when slowed down had a musical quality. And then along the same lines, we used whale vocals. For the all-important Tyrannosaurus roar, Rydstrom started by combining a lion, tiger, and alligator. But he felt something was missing. I was looking for uh, something more screechy to go on top of those low frequency elements to make it seem louder and even be more painful. Gary and I went and recorded uh, elephants at Marine World, and this one baby elephant towards the end made this one trumpet. And every time the T-Rex roars, it's a lion, tiger, alligator mixed with this one time only baby elephant, which to me is the essence of a T-Rex roar. For Jurassic Park sound designers and visual effects artists, their job was much the same as the paleontologists, to speculate on what these magnificent animals, extinct for more than 65 million years, might have been like. It was a fascinating thing because being animators, it's very much like being an actor. You become the character, so you have to sort of get your head into the head of the dinosaur. And you, you work a lot with things like, uh, do, we, do we work in packs, do we travel alone? Are we predators, are we prey? Those sorts of things are, are a big part of how we actually design the creatures. Jurassic Park will definitely be the inspiration for future generations, just as King Kong was for some. I mean, pictures of dinosaurs can do a lot for you, but when they're moving around doing something, we can all go back to movies that got us thinking about dinosaurs. Just as it was in prehistoric times, all dinosaurs were not born in Hollywood. What inspired me to become a paleontologist was, of all things, the movie Godzilla. I was five years took me, and I was so awed by this prehistoric animal that I decided that dinosaurs were the, really the subject of interest. Godzilla, who would go on to star in nearly two dozen films, made his debut in 1954 one year after the smashing success of Ray Harryhausen's Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. Well, of course, we were most flattered that they say uh, copying is the uh, most gracious form of flattery, but uh, I wanted to use stop motion because it gave a flexibility that you wouldn't have. And most children, even at five years old, know when they see something on the screen that it's a man in a suit. Other dinosaur sightings around the world included Godzilla's British counterpart, Gorgo, and a rampaging hand puppet in the 1963 Danish thriller, Reptilicus. 30 years later, dinomania spread to all corners of the globe with the mega success of Jurassic Park. We do know that it's not just American, European culture. There's something about these animals that's unique and really touches, I guess, the soul of people. And Dinomania shows no signs of slowing down. Author Michael Crichton has followed up Jurassic Park with a new dinosaur novel, entitled appropriately enough, The Lost World. Visitors to Canada's Royal Ontario Museum can observe computer-generated dinosaurs. And Universal Studios Hollywood has built its biggest attraction ever, Jurassic Park The Ride. Here, visitors come face to face with the stars of Jurassic Park. From placid herbivores, to the deadly Dilophosaurus, and of course, the T-Rex himself. Dinosaurs are nature's special effects. They're the only real monsters we know about. And for us to visit this wonderful world, we have to take a journey, not across thousands of miles, but across millions of years, a trip of the imagination. And that's very exciting. 
That journey began a century and a half ago with the marriage of art and science at Crystal Palace Park and took off with the advent of film from a simple line drawing to the masterful dinosaur performances of Willis O'Brien and Ray Harryhausen to the near perfection of Jurassic Park. And the journey isn't over yet. Ah, oh, man, forget all this digital stuff. I want to get back to the real thing. Let's get into genetic engineering. There's lots of stuff to come, and you can't even imagine what it's going to be in 100 years. I did get kind of cured from dinosaurs on Jurassic Park, but if the right project comes along, you know, that's the thing you're looking for is, you know, something to sink your teeth into. That's, you know, so compelling, you just start, you know, salivating and thinking, hmm, how it should be neat. The word extinction has no place in the realm of movie magic. As paleontological knowledge and special effects artistry continue to advance, audiences can be assured that these prehistoric wonders will continue to roam the earth. And that Dinomania will live forever.